using esophageal catheters. Um, and I was tasked with sort of providing a quick review of the respiratory mechanics. I changed it a little bit, and I'm going to do a review of the respiratory mechanics, but also a little bit of some of the physiology of the hypoxemia that goes on. Um, and then present a little bit of the pro side of the argument with some new developments that uh, came out and were recently published this past spring. So uh, there's not much disclosures for me. I have none in this area. Um, <clears throat> by way of review, it's now 51 years ago uh, that, uh, uh, the, that this disease was first published and described in The Lancet, um, and um, we're still struggling with how to treat it. Can't have a talk on ours without the definition, so I put it here. Uh, basically, it's acute onset after some exposure to some known cause that can cause ARDS. Bilateral passes consistent with pulmonary edema, but not due to cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And the severity has been changed to mild, moderate, and severe. Um, <clears throat> this is taken from the New England Journal Review. It was published in 2017. It's just really for speaking purposes. I'm purposely going to avoid all of the cytokines and inflammatory milieu here. That's not the point of this talk. But I do think it's important to point out here the, al the alveolus at the beginning, uh, early phases of um, ARDS. Um, this represents the normal side. You have complete flooding of the alveoli. You have loss of the basement membrane integrity, which allows uh, interstitial edema and fluid to flood in. Over time, this begins to clear out, but you start to have fibroblast uh, development and formation, which lays down a matrix of fibrosis and scarring, which leads to the third and sort of fibrotic stage of ARDS. And I'll show you some papers from the uh, 70s and the 90s where they look at what happens to the lung physiology and, and uh, mechanics during these different phases. One of the major problems with this disease and coming up with treatments for it is it's a very heterogeneous disease. Again, this was taken from a review article, but each of these four patients, four different radiographs, all of them have been diagnosed with ARDS. And you can see that they look vastly different. The physiologic consequences of this disease are severe. You get really severe and refractory hypoxemia, hypercapnia due to elevation in the dead space, and of course, the hallmark of the disease, which I'm going to talk about, is very poor lung compliance. So um, in kind of reviewing the older literature for this talk, you quickly go down these rabbit holes of these uh, physiologic studies from the 70s. And I'm going to go through one of them now, but I want to sort of go through um, this technique called the uh, <clears throat> midget technique. So what they do is they take, this is basically a method to determine if there's VQ inequality going on in a patient or if there's shunt physiology going on. And they take a mixture of six inert gases and they dissolve it into saline. And they then inject it into the patient. And then <clears throat> they measure the amount left in the blood and the amount expired in exhaled gas. And it can create these, uh, these graphs, which seem to be somewhat confusing. But on this axis, you have ventilation or blood flow in liters per minute um, by convention, or at least in the articles I'm showing you here. The open is the ventilation, and the closed circles are the blood flow. And on the x-axis, you have the ventilation perfusion ratio. And so you can see that in this 22-year-old healthy individual that by far the majority of the uh, ventilation of blood flow is going to the units, the VQ units and the, or the lung units that have a VQ ratio of one. So this is perfectly normal. As we age and get into our mid-40s and when a little bit older, it's not quite as perfect. And you can see a little bit of VQ inequality, but for the most part, most of the blood flow in the ventilation is clustered around the VQ unit of one. Now, Dr. Danziker from the University of Michigan, Danziker, looked at this in ARDS, because back in the 1970s, it was unclear whether the etiology of hypoxemia was due to shunt or whether it was due to VQ mismatch. And so they did this technique um, in, in patients with ARDS. And what they described in their paper, there's a couple things to point out here. One, everybody had shunt, and it ranged from anywhere. This person, I think, was 50%. Somebody down here had 60%. Others had in the 20s. But everybody had some component of shunt. You can see that the perfusion in the blood flow is, looks similar to the normal individual, but there are some differences. There are some patients, about half of the patients, had a lot of blood flow, a lot of cardiac output to very low VQ units. So these are units that have a lot of blood flow, but very little ventilation. Um, <clears throat> also, what's interesting, this, um, find a good example in a patient here. Um, there are, here's a good example. The, some of the patients, or nearly all the patients, have some blood flow and ventilation to 
to areas of VQ or to VQ units, lung units that have a normal VQ ratio. So it's really a potpourri of what's going on in the lung where you have VQ mismatching, there's clearly some shunt, and there's a significant area of normal VQ matching. Now remember, this is the 1970s, it's gonna bring up to the concept of the baby lung, but this was being developed, maybe not called the baby lung, but it was being developed, the theory at least, in the 70s where they were showing that there were some areas of normal VQ matching. Lung compliance, so Dr. Gattinoni looked at 20 patients with ARDS, this was published in the uh, American Review of Respiratory Disease, uh, the Blue Journal in 1987, and they calculated lung compliance, and they compared the lung compliance to what the CAT scan looked like. And what they found is that the lung compliance, when they calculate via pressure volume curves, correlated with the normal airway to tissue on CT imaging, but not the diseased lung. So <clears throat> the normal, when you look, plot the normal area to tissue on the y-axis, um, you can see there's a very tight correlation with the lung compliance, but not so much with the areas of the allectatic or poorly aerated lung. Furthermore, when they normalized the lung compliance to either the gas volume present on the CT or to the amount of normally aerated tissue in patients with acute respiratory failure or ARDS and normal subjects that were anesthetized and paralyzed and normal subjects that were awake during the cascade, you can see that the compliance normalized to lung gas volume was the same in the patients with severe ARDS and the patients with, that were normal. And the same when you looked at uh, the compliance normalized to the amount of normal aerated tissue was similar in those with ARDS and those that had normal lungs. We'll come back to that in a second. So also from Dr. Gattinoni in the mid-90s, published um, in, I think, the Lancet, or no, JAMA, um, they looked at the different uh, static and dynamic compliance of ARDS patients during the early, intermediate, and late phases, and not surprisingly, you can see that the lung compliance starts poor, but it only gets worse as the disease progresses to a more fibrotic stage. The same is true with your dead space. The dead space, you're very high, 70%, 80% as it progressed on. The dead, you know, the predicting death from ARDS is difficult. It's not related to hypoxemia, um, the degree of oxygenation. It's uh, more related to development of multi-system organ failure. Also, a group of investigators published data showing that it's related to the dead space. It's at 180 patients intubated with ARDS. They measured the dead space uh, about 10 hours after the diagnosis, so early into the disease. Um, and they found that the dead space was severely elevated. And for every increase in dead space by 0.05, there was a 45% increase in the odds of death. So if it goes up by 5%, you have 45% chance greater of dying from the disease. And when they created uh, quintiles and plotted uh, their uh, distribution plot, you can see that the mortality was greatest in those that had dead space in that 70 to 80% range. So all of this research and physiology sort of set up this baby lung concept. And this was done in the 70s and the 90s. This is more recent from Dr. Gattinoni. But the baby lung concept is that the area providing oxygenation and, uh, of the lung and, and the ventilation in the adult body is actually very small, more in, in line with the, the size of a child's lung. The size correlates with the compliance of the respiratory system, and this compliance of this so-called baby lung is actually near normal. Now, it's not perfectly normal, but it's, 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 it's fairly normal. And your goal, and when you're caring for these patients, is to try to prevent ventilator-induced lung injury in this area that has somewhat normal mechanics. You want to re reduce repeated alveolar collapse, opening and closing of alveoli, and obviously we need to reduce the over-distension of the alveoli. Both of these things can not only cause mechanical trauma, but more importantly, they increase the inflammatory response and worsen the disease itself. So how are we supposed to do that? Well, these are the current guidelines for treating ARDS. Everyone knows low tide bombs, plateau pressure less than 30, prone position for very severe ARDS, high PEEP rather than low PEEP, a lot of studies compare high PEEP to low PEEP without a lot of uh, clear benefit of high PEEP, but most experts and clinical, um, most experts and, and the clinical opinion agree that in general lower or higher PEEP is better, but no one knows exactly how much. Be cautious with PEEP when you're at plateau pressures near 30. Now, all of that, those recommendations are based on measuring the lung mechanics by using the airway pressures. And the problem is, is that the airway pressure can be very misleading in how you're ventilating and inflating the lung. So the transpulmonary pressures is what we really want to follow. This is the pressure that's required to inflate the lung. Um, and <clears throat> it's the alveolar pressure minus the pleural pressure. We can use the plateau pressure when you do an inspiratory hold in the ventilator to represent the alveolar pressure, 
But when you do it this way, using the airway pressures, it really reflects both the lung and the chest wall compliance, not just the lung. So we're not interested in distending the chest, we're interested in distending the lung, but of course the two go together. Um, you can calculate compliance, um, and again, when you're calculating compliance using the ventilator, the tidal volume divided by the plateau minus the total PEEP, we're assuming that chest wall compliance is negligible. It turns out that in ARDS, in up to 50% of the patients, this is absolutely not true. If somebody has uh, chest wall edema or abdominal uh, distension or they're morbidly obese, um, severe kyphoscoliosis can alter chest wall mechanics greatly. So, what is the effect on this transpulmonary pressure? So, in this cartoon drawing, the airway pressure here in both cases is 30, but the pleural pressure is five centimeters of water pressure. These are people that are invasive, you know, the cartoon is assuming that there's invasive mechanical ventilation. So, your transpulmonary pressure is the airway pressure minus the pleural pressure of 25 in this individual here. So this is more of a stiff lung. Over here, airway pressure again is 30, but the pleural pressure is much higher. And the pleural pressure is higher because of the effect of the chest wall, which they sort of drew here as a dark line. So this cartoon has a much stiffer chest. And so when you look at your pressure here, the um, transpulmonary pressure, the opening or the uh, airway pressure minus the pleural pressure, it's 15 centimeters of water pressure. So if you just go by this and look at the plateau pressure, the plateau pressure here might be high, um, when in fact it's not really reflective of what's going on in the lung, it's more reflective of what's going on in the chest wall. So the esophageal balloon, when you measure the esophageal pressure, this is a, a correlate or it's, it, it's, it's a good estimate of what's going on in the pleural space, the pleural pressure, but it permits the calculation of the chest and the lung compliance as well as the elastance. If you remember, the elastance is just simply the inverse of the compliance. The idea of using esophageal balloons is that you can titrate PEEP to the individual patient so that in the previous example, um, the patient with a chest wall um, compliance abnormalities and elastance abnormalities, you might need a little bit higher PEEP to keep the alveoli open. Also, it permits monitoring the transpulmonary pressures in an attempt to reduce the ventilator-induced lung injury. So again, it helps you separate out what's going on from the chest wall and more safely inflate just the lung. So this is, again, a cartoon drawing. Um, the esoph there's a lot of reviews on this topic recently published. This is a cartoon picture from one of them. The esophageal uh, balloon sits in the distal third of the esophagus. This uh, patient is intubated. You get your airway pressure here. Um, the airway pressure is always referenced. Everything is referenced to the body surface, so the body surface pressure is essentially zero. And you can measure your transpulmonary pressure, which is the airway pressure minus the esophageal pressure, uh, or the pleural pressure, but in this case, the esophageal pressure is the pleural pressure. And then if you want to look at the chest wall, it's the, uh, uh, the pleural pressure minus the body surface, which is zero. So essentially, your esophageal uh, catheter helps you figure out how much is coming from the chest wall, how much is coming from the lung. Here's a representative tracing. So you have flow, airway pressure. This is somebody on volume cycle ventilation. There is an incitatory pause with each breath of 0.3 seconds. And then here's your esophageal pressure. So it's up with the, the breath being delivered and back down to a baseline. The transpulmonary pressure just simply subtracts it out and it provides it here graphically. We're going to talk about when you're titrating PEEP, you look at this end expiratory occlusion pressure. Um, this is the expiratory hold. You can, when you look at your, so in the flow, there'll be no flow on the end of exhalation. The pressure, this is representative of the total PEEP. And then your esophageal pressure is here. The difference between those two is the transpulmonary pressure of the chest wall. Um, and then you can look at it for the inspiratory side where you put a, a, an inspiratory pause and you get your plateau pressure. And <clears throat> you can see here that on the esophageal pressure and then subsequent to transpulmonary pressure is calculated out below. And so this paper, which everyone knows about, the Esophageal Pressure Guided Ventilation ARDS, the EPVNET, was published in 2008. So this is a randomized controlled trial that compared mechanical ventilation directed by esophageal catheter compared to just the standard ARDS net, the sort of the standard of care now and at that time. And the goal was to keep the transpulmonary pressure at end expiration between zero and 10. So they wanted to keep it positive. If it becomes negative, then your alveoli will tend to collapse. And the tidal volume was limited to keep the transpulmonary pressure at end, end inspiration below 25. So that in the 
in the control arm, they were just shooting for a plateau pressure below 30, which was the, in, is the standard of care. And their primary outcome here wasn't anything dramatic, but it was really an improvement in their PF ratio. And they have the PEEP tables here for the control group, which is the standard ARDSNET PEEP table. Um, in the esophageal pressure guided group, this is that um, uh, the transpulmonary pressure at end expiratory occlusion. And it depended on your oxygenation, but obviously it would always be between zero, never greater than 10. Um, and it, at higher FIO2 requirements, you try to keep it closer to 10 to try to keep more alveoli open and recruit lung. So the results. So the primary outcome of the study was actually stopped early because the primary outcome was met early. And <clears throat> in, the, in the paper here, it showed that the esophageal and the group that was managed by the esophageal pressure compared to conventional therapy, the PF ratio was significantly higher at, at all the time points, 24, 48, 72 hours. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the respiratory system compliance and those that were true with the mechanical ventilation guided by the esophageal balloon, the esophageal pressure, the compliance improved compared to conventional treatment. This sort of makes sense. Um, the plateau pressure. So this is where it's a little bit confusing, right? Because although the compliance is better, the plateau pressure is actually higher. And, and the reason that this is is because you, you can allow a higher plateau pressure because you know your transpulmonary pressure is low compared to the conventional arm. Now, they, this wasn't in the main paper. This is taken from the, supplementary, uh, the supplement to the, to the publication. They did look at survival. And even though it was only, I think, 60 patients, um, there was a trend toward survival. Um, <clears throat> in those that had esophageal pressure guided protocol to, to mechanical ventilation. What was really interesting is when they showed you in the supplementary uh, data with the article in the New England Journal of Medicine, you could look at some, some representative cases, and they have a half a dozen or so. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I am going to go through two of them. So the first one is a 90-year-old you know, woman with peritonitis. High volume is set relatively low, although we don't have the weight. The FIO2 is at 60% and the PEEP is, is at uh, 12. And <clears throat> here's your airway pressure, the esophageal pressure, and then the uh, transpulmonary pressure. And you can see that at the end, ex at the end expiratory, initially this patient was minus 6. So this is before the intervention. So what this means is that there's a lot of atelectasis going on. So they want that pressure to be in a positive range for sure. And based on the table with FI2 of 0.6, they wanted it to go up to positive 4. The transpulmonary pressure before doing anything was OK. It was very low, actually. It was 3. So this patient could stand to have more ventilation if needed. So in order to meet these goals, to get this number to 4, which is what the table called for, they increased the PEEP from 12 to 24, doubled it. And they reduced the tidal volume more towards the ideal body weight, tidal volume 60 cc's per kilogram. And when they repeated, they did it in part of the protocol, they made their changes in the ventilator based on the esophageal pressure data. They did a recruitment maneuver, and then within five minutes, they repeated the same measurements. And you can see that they met their endpoint where they wanted their um, expiratory pressure to be plus four, and the transpulmonary pressure at uh, <clears throat> here is at 12. All right. So the second case I wanted to highlight is a 31 year old with the same diagnosis. Tidal volume 400, FI2 70%, and already on 24 centimeters of PEEP. And you can see that the occlusion pressure, the transpulmonary pressure at the occlusion, at expiratory occlusion, is just barely positive at plus one, and their transpulmonary pressure is very low at 10. The plateau pressure here, it's hard to see, but it's close to 40. So it's already above 30. Um, <clears throat> because they had the esophageal catheter, they wanted to get this more positive. The, the goal was to get it to 4 based on the FI2. So they went up on the PEEP, even though it was at 24, went up to 32. And they actually increased the tidal volume to 450 based on the patient's weight. Because the clinicians caring for the patient prior to enrollment saw this plateau pressure very high, so they were shooting for less than 6 cc's per kilogram. So <clears throat> look at their plateau pressure after they made their changes. Actually, it went up 50. And the transpulmonary pressure and inspiratory, and inspiratory occlusion is still relatively low at plus 15. Remember, in the paper, they're allowed to go up to 25. Um, this is a very good example of a chest wall, in this case, probably the abdomen in a patient with peritonitis, leading to elevated um, elastins, abnormal elastins of the chest wall, abnormal compliance, and falsely elevating your plateau pressure. So 
Without an esophageal balloon, probably none of, not many of us in the room would be willing to push a plateau pressure much above 40 and approaching 50, but with the esophageal balloon, you're able to get away with that uh, because you can monitor the transpulmonary pressure. So most people in the audience should say, well, geez, can't you show me anything that's not 10 years old at this point? I mean, it is 2018. That was published in 2008. And the fact is that less than 1% of the patients worldwide have esophageal pressure measured for clinical reasons. Why? Well, it's difficult, it's complex. Most clinicians uh, don't use these devices, um, so there's a little bit of a knowledge gap, but the biggest reason is that there's arguments over whether or not the esophageal pressure is actually representative of what's going on in the pleural space. And it turns out that in ARDS, there's a very large vertical gradient from the distal or within the, from the base of the lung to the apex of the lung in the pleural pressure. So does this esophageal pressure represent dependent areas of the lung or the more anterior areas with less atelectasis? Does it represent the, that or the baby lung? Well, there's two ways to calculate transpulmonary pressure. You can do the direct method, which is what I showed you already, just subtract the airway pressure from the esophageal pressure, but also through derivatives of, of the formulas that are basic physiology, you can do it by looking at the um, <clears throat> elastin's um, ratio of the chest wall to the respiratory system. So there was a paper published in the Blue Journal by Dr. Yoshida um, just this spring. And what they did to try to settle this argument, they looked at esophageal manometry and regional transpulmonary pressure in lung-injured pigs and human cadavers. So they measured the direct pleural pressure in independent and non-dependent areas of the lung, they measured the esophageal pressures, and then they compared the two, and they also looked at the transpulmonary pressure measured by the elastins. These were done in, in pigs that were, um, I think they infused oleic acid into the lungs to cause ARDS and in human cadavers. And what they found is that the esophageal pressure does pretty good at estimating the pleural pressure near the catheter. So here, the expiratory transpulmonary pressure, this is the one that used to help guide PEEP, when the PEEP is low and the lung is not very, here's the esophageal catheter, it very nicely, yeah, that's the dependent area of the lung, that's where you think it would be. When you add a lot of PEEP and the lung gets recruited, the esophageal catheter now is more up in this area, and it might not be an independent. And when they looked at the, esoph the, tra the expiratory transpulmonary pressure calculated using the esophageal catheter, it correlated very nicely with this dashed line, which represented the pleural pressure that they measured. They put a, monitor, they put a device into the pleura of these pigs and in the human cadaver to measure that. But in the area up here where they had a pleural pressure, it didn't correlate very well at all. And they looked at um, the expiratory transpulmonary pressure um, compared to PEEP, and on this axis is the amount of atelectasis measured by impedance plethysmography. And they basically saw here that the minimum transpulmonary pressure at this end expiration to prevent collapse was 4.6 at a PEEP of 16. So it's similar in lines with that EPV trial that I just showed you. They were shooting for keeping it positive below 10 in the mid-10 mid range. Now, the transpulmonary pressure, or the inspiratory um, transpulmonary pressure is better calculated using the um, ratio of the elastins. And that measurement rep is represented by the red line. The dark line, thick line, is the esophageal pressure. So the, cath the esophageal pressure to measure the transpulmonary pressure at end inspiration when there's an inspiratory pause is represented here. Here is the uh, pleural pressure measured in the dependent area of the lung, and here is the pleural pressure measured in, in the more anterior section. And you can see that in this case, the elastance ratio method, rather than a direct method, was more re representative of what's going on in the anterior, what's more going on in the baby lung, in the more anterior regions in this disease. So the message from this study is that the esophageal pressure is pretty good at calculating what f the uh, transpulmonary and expiratory occlusion pressure that you use to, to titrate PEEP. Um, this area measures the, um, <clears throat> the, the pleural pressure near the catheter. So usually in the more dependent areas. But if you want to look at the transpulmonary pressure to see if you're ventilating safely, the suggestion is to more use the elastance ratio. So who cares? This is pigs and basically dead people. We're not interested in treating them. But it's important because the trial that I described earlier, this um, esophageal uh, guided pressure, uh, or using esophageal pressure as a guided mechanical ventilation, this was a, that was a single center trial, but now it's being a multi-center trial is enrolling patients. And, and there's a couple, ans a couple questions that come up. First, we don't really know what the ideal transpulmonary pressure to target is. Is it 15, 20, or 25? No one knows. They use 25. They're using the same criteria that they used in the first one. So the 
for calculating PEEP and the transpulmonary pressure at end expiration occlusion, they want it between 0 and 10. For transpulmonary pressure at end inspiratory occlusion, they want it less than 25. Well, for the, for the end expiratory occlusion, it's actually going to be pretty good, right? That's what they showed in, Yoshida showed in his study. But if you use the transpulmonary pressure, it'll be underestimated in non-dependent areas of the lung. So their pressure, they may shoot for a pressure of 25, and when if they get 15 or 20, they think they're safe, but in reality, the true transpulmonary pressure may be higher. So I don't know, I, I'm not involved in this trial, so I don't know how they're handling these data, but I'm sure they're coming up with some plan. So to end, personalized medicine is sort of the buzzword. We do it in lung cancer with molecular markers. We do it in COPD now, inhaled steroids. Uh, for people who have exacerbations or maybe people who have elevated eosinophils, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, lung volume reduction surgery have been doing for years. Asthma the same way, biologic therapy and bronchothermoplasty. I think with ARD, yes, if we're going to treat this disease, which is very, very heterogeneous and different between patients, that we're going to have to personalize it as well, but we are going to need some more evidence. So that's it. And then I guess we're going to have a discussion at the, uh, at the end. Hopefully, I'll let you have some time. Thank you, Nate, for your great presentation. I think it's going to save me some time uh, with that introduction. Uh, I'm Max Tamaika Caso. I'm from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, Spectrum Health, Michigan State University. Um, I want to thank, uh, well, the organizing committee for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. So I think uh, it, I'm going to change the title. I was assigned to. Uh, Esophageal pressure is not routinely needed in ARDS ventilation. So uh, I, I don't have conflict of interest related to this talk. And the objectives will be to understand the pot potential sources of errors uh, in the use of esophageal manometry, recognize different methods to estimate transpulmonary pressure, and recognize alternative methods to monitor lung mechanics. So uh, Nate talked pretty well about this. Um, you have a, a patient who is intubated, and you have the uh, esophageal catheter uh, manometer with a balloon, okay, that has to be placed in the lower third of the esophagus. So usually you advance to the stomach, and then you start to pull until you can see the cardiac oscillations. And in the, on the ventilator, you can see the, the flow the, the pressure of the airway, and you can add, if you have the ventilator that can, has the interface with the uh, esophageal uh, manometer, um, you can see the esophageal pressure, huh? and you can estimate what is the transpulmonary pressure. So uh, we know that the el elastin of the uh, respiratory system is uh, composed by the elastin of the lung in a normal uh, person would be most of the elastin is secondary to the uh, long elastins and the elastin of the chest wall. Okay, so in a, pr a volume pressure curve, we can see what is the relationship for the chest wall and for the lung, okay? And then we have the, what would be the respiratory system, which is this one, okay? So at, at pressure of zero, that's the FRC. Hmm? So at FRC, the pressure uh, in the lung will be positive, compens compensating the negative uh, uh, pressure in the chest wall. Mm. So there are technical sources of errors when you place this uh, a, a catheter, es esophageal catheter. So one is the position. It has to be in the lower third of the esophagus. Otherwise, uh, might not give you the uh, plural pressure that you need to estimate um, the long uh, mechanics. If you, if you don't inflate uh, with enough air, you can underestimate the esophageal pressure, I mean the, the plural pressure. And if you put too much air, you can overestimate the, uh, the plural pressure. 
And this is not important in a normal person, you know, uh, minimal variation in the plural pressure uh, still going to be in the safe uh, in, or a steep line of the relationship of the lung. But in a patient with ARDS, that can make a difference uh, looking for a safe uh, transpulmonary pressure. So what can affect the, the esophageal pressure? Well, one is the position of the person. So this was a study in normal persons, but they look at the, 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 the volume and the transpulmonary pressure in different positions. So when the patients were prong or lateral uh, or uh, upright, they had about the same relationship. But, but when the patients were supine, these patients had a more negative transpulmonary pressure. So if you can see the, the, when the patient was upright, the mean pressure was three centimeters of water and the supine is about minus three. And the volume will also change compared to the total lung capacity. So part of this difference could be attributed to change in volume and the weight of the mediastinal content. But when uh, they, um, they, they concluded in the study that there should, that still they need to correct the transpulmonary pressure for the effect of line supine. So it should be added, you know, three centimeters of water. So we see that, we, we know that in patients with the ARDS, um, they have a increased elastance of the respiratory system. And when they use the esophageal manometry to determine how much of the elastin was uh, due to the lung and how much of the elastin was due to the increased elastin of the chest wall. Patients who had ARDS uh, originally from the lung, from pneumonia, for example, most of the elastins was because of increased elastin of the lung, not so much of, from the chest wall. But the patient who had extra pulmonary ARDS, they had an increased elastin of the chest wall. Okay, so is the transpulmonary pressure the same at different regions of the lungs? Well, we know that the lungs are not, a, are in a normal person is homogeneous, but in patients with the ARDS, a, you have an increase in homogeneity as the ARDS increases in severity. So this is a picture of a normal person uh, with normal lungs, patient with mild a ARDS, moderate ARDS, and severe ARDS. So they had a, this CAT scan and they could evaluate the, the difference in the uh, stress of the lungs. And you can see here, white, in the white bar you, is, is a person with normal lungs. Black, uh, the black bar is a patient with a ARDS. And this range relates to patient with homogeneous lungs. And you can see how as the, 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 the in, inhomogeneity increases, uh, in, in patients with ARDS. So the lungs are not entirely the same. It's not all ARDS, it's not all the normal lung. You can see it on the, on the CAT scans. Um, so you may have the same pressure in the airway, but the plural pressure will be different depending on the region of the lung. Okay, so if, if, the, if, if you, if you were able to measure the plural pressure, you know, uh, at the basis will, will be higher than the plural pressure, you know, uh, in the uh, uh, upper part of the, or uh, anterior part of the lungs. Mm -hmm. uh, so not, the, the plural pressure is not the, 
you have an average, but it's not the same in all the regions of the lung. Then, how do we determine the transpulmonary pressure? So measuring the pleural pressure directly is difficult and invasive. So there are two strategies that Nate mentioned before uh, that have been developed to estimate the pleural pressure and transpulmonary pressure. And both are using esophageal manometry. One is measuring the esophageal pre pressure directly as an estimate of pleural pressure, okay? And the other one is estimating the pleural pressure by using the change in esophageal pressure during tidal ventilation to calculate the chest wall elastin. It's a ratio between the chest wall elastin to the respiratory system elastins. So the first one that used the value of the esophageal pressure as a, um, a estimate of the pleural pressure makes a very simple uh, calculation. So transpulmonary pressure, you know, is the difference between the airway pressure and the pleural pressure. And this was used in the study by Talmore, okay, where in the group that was uh, guided by esophageal pressure, they determined the transpulmonary pressure depending on the FiO2 compared to the control group that used the ARCS network table. <coughs> and there was a difference, you know, in the um, in, uh, transpulmonary pressure and end of expiration. So they, they increased the pressure in the group that was uh, managed with the esophageal manometry. There was a difference also in the um, esophage, esophageal pressure that was not statistically significant, but trying to be higher at the end of inspiration. And that was because the transpulmonary pressure, the target was to be below 25, and most of these patients were below 15. Um, and the plateau, as you can see, was higher in the group that was managed by esophageal uh, <coughs> manometry. And they the, the primary outcome was uh, improvement in <coughs> oxygenation, and that was significant. And there was a trend in improving uh, immortality. Hmm? Uh, this was not statistically significant. <coughs> so the other way of uh, calculating the transpulmonary pressure is through the estimation of the elastans, okay? So this, this was uh, used in a study by uh, Grasso, where he, uh, this was at the, at the time of the H1N1. So he triaged patients with the ARDS to ECMO or just mechanical ventilation based on the respiratory me mechanics. So he received 14 patients that he had to decide which ones would go to ECMO and which ones could be handled or uh, you know, treated just with invasive mechanical ventilation. And this was the formula he used to determine the transpulmonary pressure. So he estimated the plural pressure based on the airway and the elastans, okay? So the difference in pressure over the difference in volume will give you the, the elastans with a, um, a, with the esophageal uh, balloon, you can estimate what is the, the plural pressure based on this. And you can see that, you know, at baseline, both groups uh, had the same severity based on the Apache 2 score and the Murray's score, okay? It was seven and seven. And uh, there was an improvement in oxygenation in the group that was managed just with a mechanical ventilation, and just one patient died, okay? So just increasing the PEEP based on the transpulmonary pressure that was calculated looking for the elastans, uh, you know, was enough to improve the oxygenation and just one patient died. And the, in the group with the ECMO, well, just two patients, so it was not differently. But you ex expect, so patients with ARDS, uh, severe hypoxemia, you know, well, they just, looking at the lung mechanics, they determine which ones could be handled 
with uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. So we have two ways to determine the um, uh, transpulmonary pressure. One that is based on the esophageal pressure as an estimate of uh, pleural pressure, and one, one that is, uh, is uh, using the elastans to determine uh, uh, the transpulmonary pressure. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that uh, they correlate, okay? So there is a correlation when you use one or the other uh, in terms of changing the PIP. But the problem is that doesn't correlate perfectly. And, you know, one third of the patient would have a, a recommended PIP that would be in the opposite direction. So one method will tell you we should increase the PIP, while the other method will tell you, no, we shouldn't increase the PIP. So that could be, you know, a concern in somebody with ARDS and increase, uh, I mean, hypoxemia, and you need to improve the oxygenation. So this was the study by Yoshida that uh, Nate uh, described earlier. Um, so they use pigs, and they uh, also uh, later uh, measure in cadavers. Uh, the reg regional plural pressure was measured using uh, plural sensors, okay? So those were placed uh, surgically in the pigs and, and the cadavers. And the transpulmonary pressure was measured by the du direct measurement, okay, uh, of the uh, plural pressure that was done in the non-dependent part of the lung and also in the dependent part of the lung, doing expiration and inspiration. Uh, they also measured um, the last time of the chest wall at the end of inspiration. So the, the, the last time can be measured only during inspiration because you use the difference in pressure and the, the difference in tidal volume during the inspiration to calculate the, the last tense. And he showed it that there was a good correlation between the plural uh, pressure, the transpulmonary pressure using the, the plural pressure um, measured by the esophageal manometry in the dependent area, not as much in the uh, non-dependent areas. This is um, a, in, in pigs, hmm? uh, the transpulmonary pressure at the end of expiration. And this is uh, in cadavers. It had the same um, uh, trend. Hmm? And here, this is doing inspiration. The other one was doing expiration. You can see that the uh, plural transpulmonary pressure using just the plural pressure to estimate the transpulmonary pressure has a good correlation in the dependent areas, but not in non-dependent areas. For the non-dependent areas, the uh, calculation of the chest wall elastans was better. Now, is the use of esophageal manometry standardized? Uh, this is the, 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 the report of the uh, uh, SAFE uh, registry where we can see that just 1% of the population with ARDS in 50 countries uh, are uh, treated with a esophageal manometry. Okay, and mostly those ones with severe ARDS. Mm -hmm. But on average, is less than 1% of patients with ARDS. Uh, what is the impact of, phys uh, of uh, physician education? So how much do we know about this? This was a study where they took physicians, you know, from the emergency critical care, uh, uh, pulmonary critical care, and they ask them questions, okay? So here, uh, well, I don't know. Sorry. So the first one shows what was the question, the, how they responded, 
White would be one response. The, the gray one is a different response. They received later a lecture about esophageal manometry in ARDS, and that was the test after the response. So they re these are four cases scenarios, and you can see the changes okay, in management after the lecture. So it's not that we, uh, it's not very commonly used, less than 1% of the you know, patients are treated with uh, esophageal manometry in ARDS, <coughs> and I think it's, uh, we need to know what we're gonna do if we're gonna use it. And, is not standardized yet how to use it. Is there a non-invasive method to evaluate lung mechanics? Um, so Nate mentioned today, you know, uh, how to calculate the mechanics of the lung. We have the compliance of the respiratory system, which is the difference in tidal volume over driving pressure, which is the difference between the plateau and the PIP. Having the same tidal volume, if we increase the PIP, could happen that the plateau goes down, which means that the compliance improved or the elastance went down. If we increase the PIP and the plateau goes up, that means that the compliance goes down or the elastance worsens. So, this was uh, the study by Amato that showed a correlation based on the driving pressure. So patients who had the, uh, uh, it's not working, oh, yeah. The same PIP and had an increase in the driving pressure had an increase in mortality. Having an increase in PIP with the same driving pressure, you know, the mortality or the risk of death is about the same. And in those patients that you increase the PIP and the driving pressure decreases, the mortality goes down. Because those are patients that you are able to recruit long and actually you, know, you improve the compliance as you recruit the long. So going back to the study by Talmor, he increased the esophageal pressure uh, at the end of expiration based on this value. Uh, maintain the same uh, transpulmonary pressure at the end of uh, inspiration. He was able to increase the PIP based on this value and the um, compliance improved. We can see the results here. At, at baseline, the PIP in the group treated with the uh, esophageal manometry was 14, and in the group treated with a conventional uh, mechanical ventilation, the PIP was 15. Mm -hmm. The plateau pressure was 29 in both groups. And after three days, the PIP that was managed with um, uh, esophageal manometry was 18, and the PIP in the group that was Manage uh, conventionally was 12. And you can see the plateau pressure is 28 in the group that was managed with an esophageal balloon. And it was 25 in the group that was managed with uh, just conventional measures. So that means that the driving pressure of the group that was managed with an esophageal balloon was 15. At baseline, it was 10. It went down, okay? And this is data that you could just get it from the PIP and from the plateau. And the other group remained the same. Now, what we know, and these are the recommendations from the guidelines, is that low tidal volume is important to decrease a, a uh, lung injury. As the ARDS increases, higher PIP that was just, you know, estimated using a table was beneficial in a meta-analysis. Neuromuscular blockade, you know, is, seems to be beneficial. It's just one trial, 
that was uh, in one center, so that's why it's yellow. But improved mortality. Prone position also improved mortality. Uh, so how to determine the high PEEP is not, there is no study that you know, tells you what is the best way to do it, using invasive or non-invasive. But uh, given what I've shown you, uh, I think that just using the uh, no, long mechanics in a non-invasive way, paralyzing the patient, and uh, using uh, prone position, that would be the way to go without need of uh, esophageal uh, manometry. So in summary, the use of esophageal manometry requires to understand technical limitations, uh, can estimate pleural pressure directly or estimating indirectly estimating the chest wall elastance. Esophageal pressure reflects pleural pressure in the lung adjacent to the esophageal balloon that would be the dependent lung. Inspiratory transpulmonary pressure calculated from elastin ratio reflects non-dependent lung. Non-invasive lung mechanics may help to select the PEEP. Um, patients with severe ARDS should be treated with neuromuscular blockade, prone position, and possibly ECMO until further studies show benefit of invasive bedside respiratory mechanics monitoring. Thank you. So I think we have time for questions. So, um, sorry about the coughing fit. I have a question for instance. You use it in select patients. What transformative pressure do you shoot for? Uh, well, that, that, that's a good question. I, usually we use uh, transpulmonary pressure, you know, below uh, 20. Um, it, although the, 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 the studies, uh, they, they, they took a, a threshold of 25. But um, when we use it is when, when we have patients that have a very high plateau and we are not sure uh, the cause and patients have uh, morbid obesity or have ascites or pleural effusions. And we think that we don't need to uh, prone the patient. Uh, we just try to find out what is the, the uh, transpulmonary pressure and if we have room to increase the PEEP. Uh, sometimes when you have that high plateau, you know, it, it's not uh, easy to do the uh, long mechanics in a non-invasive way. Right. <clears throat> so, thanks for the presentation. I just uh, wanted to know if we are using the transpulmonary pressure and uh, in these uh, patients uh, increasing the PEEP that uh, to a, such a high level and ARDS being a heterogeneous process, uh, was there an increase in pneumothorax and barotrauma in one group or the other, or? The risk, the risk for uh, pneumothorax is when you have a high transpulmonary pressure, that what determines the, you know, the, the stress of the lung. Um, I don't recall uh, any uh, complication like pneumothorax in these uh, studies. Uh, reported, I don't know if you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think that the rate of pneumothoraces were higher because of what he alluded to. You know, if, if you're going to jack up the pressures that high, you're trying to monitor the transformative pressure, and you in your when you go up from PEEP, and you know the example I showed, I think it went from like 24 to 32, which is really high, right? Um, you know, you're monitoring that end expiratory uh, occlusion pressure there, the transformative pressure, so you're not letting it get above that. So theoretically, if you're monitoring it, it shouldn't happen. Without them, yeah, I think, at least theoretically, you might have a, you could run the risk of getting higher. Yes? What do you take these measurements when you do short-term neuromuscular blockade to calculate pressure? But the history is no preventive screen, really. Yeah. <laughs> well, usually when, when we try uh, the, the esophageal balloon, the patient is already paralyzed. Yeah. And 
that helps you. But you could use, you know, deep sedation, and you can look at the, the, the esophageal pressure to see if the patient is doing any effort as well. But yes, uh, if you use paralytics, you know, it, that would give you a, a more accurate uh, measurement. So we both did kind of glaze over that fact, but in most of these studies, the patients are very heavily sedated or paralyzed. Um, you can calculate the amount of work of breathing and the um, triggering that the patient's doing um, if you wanted to, but for ARDS, most of the time, they're paralyzed or at least deeply sedated. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, the, the transpulmonary uh, driving pressure um, has been used for prognosis and showing that it's been better uh, to estimate, you know, in patients who have increased uh, uh, elastance. Uh, but I, otherwise, you know, using the usual uh, driving pressure and looking at the baseline, and after you uh, make the changes in the PIP, that should be uh, good enough. Thanks for attending and sticking to the end.